Tonic sol fa is a musical notation which uses letters of the alphabet and punctuation marks in a prescribed way to denote pitch and rhythm. And that's not a complete definition, but that gives you the idea. So a page of staff or conventional or traditional Western musical notation such as this looks in tonic sol fa like this. The origins of tonic sol fa are not <coughs> Welsh. Indeed, the actual notes of the scale, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, are derived from a medieval Latin hymn and are used in some countries, in France, for instance, to denote keys. where They refer to ut majeur, re majeur, and so on. But tonic sol fa as a formalized notation is a creation of the 19th century. It emerged in the age of improvement when teachers, instructors, ministers, and Sunday school leaders were concerned to find a simple method of teaching singing to the young, particularly in what we would today call disadvantaged areas. It was not the only method developed around that time. There was a considerable vogue for the Willem method using a fixed dough, a method that was promoted vigorously by John Pike Huller in his capacity as an inspector of schools. But the solfa, which eventually became successful and superseded Willem and, and all other techniques, was developed from a method used by Miss Sarah Glover of Norwich, who looks positively Dickensian in that picture. <laughs> <laughs> she looks as if she's come straight out of the old curiosity shop. Um, I don't know whether that's drawn from life or just an artist's impression. It's the only picture I could find. <laughs> Miss Sarah Glover had developed um, a method for teaching singing to children using the principle of a movable dough, uh, the, you know, the bass note, which made all keys essentially the same. That is, they could all be expressed uh, as do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. And so you were always in the tonic key, and hence the name tonic sol, fa. And there were other similar methods in circulation. There was a Lancashire sol, fa, for instance, but the man who perfected the method based on Miss Glover, uh, Miss Glover's work and eventually founded a society, a college, and a publishing firm was John Kerwin. He was in the National Beards competition as well. <laughs> John Kerwin was a Congregationalist minister who wanted a reliable means of teaching sight singing. So successful was his tonic sol fa method that he eventually gave up the ministry to concentrate on spreading the gospel of Solfar and developing education in Solfar and developing the Kerwin Press. And as Sean has, has said, of course, the exhibition that's uh, to be seen here at the moment does contain examples of tonic Solfar. Kerwin published his Grammar of Vocal Music in 1843, but it was in the 1850s that he established the developed Solfar notation and began issuing a series of textbooks which contained carefully graded lessons in solfa. Notably, in 1858, the standard course of lessons on the tonic solfa method of teaching to sing, a nice snappy title. He also set up a journal some years before then, the Tonic Solfa Reporter, which was aimed at solfa classes and all interested people. So how did tonic solfa come to Wales? Well, in one form or another, it existed in the 1850s. As early as 1852, a man called David Nicholas was using a kind of solfa to teach singing and as a means of introduction to the staff notation at Comavan near Port Talbot. And not far away at Kenfig Hill near Bridgend, a man called Config Davis established a solfa class in 1854. Lewis Hopkin is known to have started teaching solfa in Cardiff around 1857. I don't have pictures of any of them, I'm afraid. Now, all these no doubt used Kerwin's techniques as set out in his early publications in the Grammar of Vocal Music. But the really dramatic birth of enthusiasm for the tonic, as it came to be known, occurred in the early 1860s. And the chief credit is usually accorded to a Liverpool Welshman called Eliezer Roberts. He was much impressed by a lecture he heard John Kerwin give in Liverpool in 1860 and took up the study of solfa himself before moving on to found classes in Liverpool in which he proved the success of Kerwin's method by teaching children to sight sing in several parts. 
Robert saw that tonic sulfur could be highly beneficial in Wales, particularly in the context of Sunday schools and chapel singing. And it's worth remembering that Kerwin's ultimate purpose was as much moral as musical, and that the tonic sulfur movement in Wales, as elsewhere, was to be very closely linked to chapel life. Roberts obtained Kerwin's permission to translate his textbooks into Welsh, for a country that was, of course, still predominantly Welsh-speaking, and so began publishing Llawlifer Caniadaeth, the first part of which appeared in 1861, to be followed by others, notably a Gavres Savonol, which was the translation of uh, Kerwin's substantial work in several parts. And in that same year, 1861, Roberts issued the first of five parts of a collection of hymns and tunes, Hymnae Athonae, printed in Solfar, the first Welsh book to appear in the letter notation. Um, the scan isn't wonky. The, um, the copy I have is, is, is like that. You know, the, uh, the, the, the cover's been wrongly cut, so everything is a bit ski with. Um, I, di I did try very hard to get the scan straight, but, <laughs> but that's how it is. Uh, and this is an illustration of a quite extraordinary Victorian self-help hymn <coughs> from the collection. Um, the, if, if, if you can read Welsh, you can read the words very quickly. Um, it's hardly a hymn at all. It's really an injunction to people to be in time for everything. <laughs> and, and in the last verse, it says, we'll uh, also be in time for eternity. Um, but but, but it, it starts off, you, if, my child, you want to succeed in the world. And it, it's a very interesting uh, link between so far as a method of teaching singing and the whole idea, uh, the whole Victorian idea of self-help. You know, the, the, the moral purpose uh, was closely linked to uh, the Solfar movement. Now, while Roberts himself actively promoted Solfar, he was fortunate to find a useful and powerful ally in the person of another Roberts, though no relation as far as I know, John Roberts, Yayan Gwilt, a man I have bored audiences to death <laughs> talking about him over the years. Yayan was a zealous music critic, journalist, and reformer concerned to raise musical standards in Wales, particularly in relation to congregational singing. During the early 1860s, Eliezer Roberts convinced Yayan of the potential value of Solfar for the teaching of singing. And so he was able to harness Yayan's own crusading zeal and the resources he had at his disposal, in particular, the music journal a Cerdor Cymraeg, which Yeyan had founded in 1861, and which in 1865 was taken over by the major publishing house of Hughes and Son of Wrexham. From its inception, a Cerdor Cymraeg had published music supplements, just like the uh, musical times on which it was modelled. And by 1865, some of these began to appear in tonic solfar. They were also issued and sold separately, and so Hughes and Son began to accumulate their own catalogue of solfar music. This coming together of forces helped the solfar juggernaut to get moving. And by 1869, Hughes and Son were able to launch a periodical, Cerdor Atonic Solfar, again edited by Yeyan Gwilt, and like Kerwin's Tonic Solfar Reporter, on which it was no doubt modelled, aimed specifically at solfaists, as you can see from the heading. It says a, a monthly periodical uh, for tonic solfar classes. Although it only lasted five years, uh, I think it was quite successful uh, while it was being published. Now, both Kerdor Tonic Solfar and a Kerdor Cymraeg gave significant attention to the growth of the movement in Wales in the late 1860s and early 1870s, and not only attempted to instruct people in solfar and uh, help the activities of solfar classes, but also recorded the activities of the classes. So you get on the pages of tonic solfar, Kerdora tonic solfar, you get the, uh, a strong impression of how tonic solfar developed in Wales and how classes were being founded uh, in different parts of Wales. And we can see how well and how quickly the new notation caught on, at least in those early years.